Good morning and welcome to iteration number three uh, in which we're gonna focus on starting and playing the game. In the previous iterations we set up the project and planned the different iteration uh, activities. The, uh, we worked on the help screen and we learned how to we did set up the navigation for all the different screens in the project and we uh, learned how we can play an audio file inside our application and we learned how to use an argument and uh, to pass information about the, the user interface component to the controller. In this iteration number three, we're going to start working with the game and focus on the beginning and the playing of a sound. So we're going to try to build on what we learned in iteration number two and face an, an additional challenge. So the purpose of iterative, iterative life cycle and having an iteration plan is to break down the larger project that perhaps is overwhelming, perhaps you don't know much of the techniques to, to use or the technologies, to break that down into smaller projects, smaller activities, start by activities that build on your previous knowledge, something that you know how to do, and learn something new one at a time, and by the end of the iterations, you will have gained number one, considerable knowledge, but number two, you would have built the application that perhaps in the beginning you thought you could never build an application of that type. So although the process may seem uh, boring to you and dull, uh, believe me, this is a, a, a very effective process to take you from uh, whatever state you are in, in terms of your knowledge, skills, and experience, and enable you to produce uh, a powerful and effective application. So the first step of the iterative uh, process is uh, of the, uh, the problem-solving process, uh, which we apply in every iteration, is to formulate the problem, formulate the solution, and implement the solution. Formulating the problem, we ask ourselves, and this, uh, we have three steps. Uh, step one is research, try to understand the problem and try to see what other products in the market that try to solve this problem. Um, we're gonna do some research here uh, because the problem of creating a game is new to us, so we need to get a better understanding of what what is in a game. Uh, then we're going to define the scope of this particular iteration, uh, how are we going to test it, and then move on to the solution formulation. So what are what I would call here the states of the game? The, the word state means a moment in time. Uh, is the game at the same behavior or the same moment of time uh, during the uh, execution of that game, or does it change the state? Does it go from one point to the other, um, and each point has its own characteristics and its own features? So we, uh, in the help screen, for instance, the help screen had the same state. The help screen has some buttons, and it's always in the state of waiting for the user. If the user click on any of the buttons, the help screen produces a sound. That's it. It doesn't change. Uh, except in that one time where the user hit the button and then it plays a sound, no, no more uh, state. So actually we can say it's two states. The first state is the idle state, uh, providing instructions and waiting for the user to play a button or leave. And then the user click a button, it moves the help screen to the second state. And in that second state, the help screen plays a sound. So how about the game? What happens in the game? So the game uh, we, we use the game screen uh, as our first screen. So the, you, the game is or the app is waiting for the user to start a game, go to the help or, or do statistics. So the first state is waiting for the game to start. Then the user will click start game. Once the user click start game, it moves the game to that initial uh, state, uh, which will then uh, moves the game to playing a sound. So the game will play a sound to the user and wait for the user to select an answer. Then the game will check the answer and uh, if the answer is correct, it will mark it as such. If it's incorrect, it will display to the user uh, responses as such. Then the game will go back to playing another sound and then wait for the user to select an answer and check the answer, then go and play another sound, 
wait for the user to select an answer, check the answer, and keep repeating that for as many turns in the game as you would like. So if you want to three turns, five turns, six turns, 10 turns, 50 turns, whatever you want, it's gonna keep moving between these two states until it completes all the number of turns. When all the turns have completed, it will move to the end game. So what happens at end the game? The game will need to give the user the score and update the statistics, the history, because a game has been completed. So we need to update the statistics that we have. You will see that in the start game and the player sound, there will be some adjustments, even in the check answer, uh, when the check answer determines the answer correct or incorrect, it will display information to the user. So when you go back to play the sound, you will have to reset the turn and you will see that uh, this reset will involve a few things and will work on it. In fact, when you start the game, you will also need to reset the game and, uh, and make some adjustments and some changes there. So this is overall the full picture that it takes to get a game. Uh, our game here is very simple. Uh, for instance, we're displaying the score at the end. Uh, you may say, no, I want to display the score automatically as soon as the user uh, makes an answer. Um, here, the user just to the game just to plays the sound one time. You may consider adding as an extra credit, allowing the user to hear the sound again uh, in the while waiting for the user to select an answer. While it is waiting, the it, it, the user can maybe uh, have the game play the sound again and again. You may add some interactivity if you want to make this a social game or a multiplayer game. Maybe they can. Uh, ask one of their friends and then the game sends uh, a notification to that friend uh, and send them to listen to the sound and give back. You can, you can expand on any of these states as much as you want to add uh, uh, features, interactivity, uh, sophistication, complexity. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna do uh, be building um, a text-based game. Uh, you don't have to make it text-based. You can uh, do graphics. You can uh, do uh, more animation. We're gonna do some animation here. That you can do a lot more uh, than that. Uh, but the basic idea, the basic um, structure that you see or architecture uh, that you see in front of you uh, will hold. So based on that, what's the scope of this particular iteration? Uh, we will focus on the user starting the game, the game playing a, a music note, um, and then the user selects an answer, and then the game moves to the next turn until it ends, and I'm gonna test it here with only three uh, turns. So how are we going to test this? Um, the, uh, we have to, because the game is going to play the sound at random, we have to find a way to know which note was picked. So we're going to uh, introduce you to uh, the, the concept of logging, uh, which is uh, uh, having the game blend uh, to the output screen uh, some values in order for us to check uh, what the game is doing and then compare that log with the answers that we select. So we're gonna play different turns and maybe select some correct answers, incorrect answers, and see if the app is uh, doing correct uh, evaluation of the different uh, answers. So how are we going to tackle this problem? We follow the model view controller design pattern. The model focus on the data, the view on the user interface, and the uh, controller uh, focus on what the, uh, the logic and the uh, responsiveness of the app and the events that triggers the app to do the functionalities. So what data do we have here? We have the music note files and you can download those from the uh, Blackboard assignment section. Uh, it's mp3 files. If you are not in my class and watching these videos, you probably uh, can use any mp3 files you want. Uh, and, 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 and it will work. Uh, we need the collection of the music files. So we, uh, here I'm, I'm, have, I'm gonna use 12 different music files. So we need to have a collection of those 
uh, because we're going to do something similar to what we did in module one. If you remember module one, we wanted to display a code at random. So we discussed that the randomization actually happens on the index of the collection, not on the actual text of the code. The same thing here to randomize. I need to put all the files in a collection and then randomize the index of that collection and pick the file at that random index. Uh, so we need the collection. Uh, we need to count how many turns and we need the name of the node that is being played because we're going to have to compare that with what the user have selected. So the, uh, the, the view, uh, see the interface, and uh, we've uh, looked at that in the previous uh, module, and there's no changes in, in that. The solution formulation, uh, the controller, so we're going to follow the game life cycle. We're going to build multiple functions here. So one of the challenges in the controller in this game is there will be several functions. The, the concept of a function in the controller class is that it's a collection of instructions, instru a collection of single lines of instruction that serves a single purpose. So every function needs to do one thing. So if, the, if we need to start a game, that will become a function. We're going to reset the game. We should do it a different function, playing the sound a different function, ending the game, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we're going to be trying to build as many of those as we can. Uh, when the game starts, the game will uh, start a new turn and random sound will be played, then it will wait for the user to select a possible answer. Uh, when the user click on a button with the answer, it will evaluate the user's answer and uh, plays another sound. Uh, here, we, uh, if we play another sound immediately because the app processor is extremely fast, the user will not see and you will, I will demonstrate that in the, when we get to it in the uh, application. Uh, so we're going to use uh, a library called NS Timer. The NS Timer uh, is like a counter and, uh, and, and holds the app for a, 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 a certain period of time before the app functions. So it, it, it does some very cool things. Uh, and then we're going to evaluate if the number of turns reaches three. And if that happens, then the game uh, would end. So how are we going to determine that the number of turns reach three? So far, we have only been using uh, in the controller single lines of instructions that execute. And once we are in a function, all the lines of instructions inside the function are executed sequentially in order from the top to the bottom. The, what we need here is ability to make a decision. A decision in terms of we need to either skip some sections of the instruction or execute them based on a condition. So that takes us to uh, one of the uh, control structures, or one of the important features in uh, uh, programming is the decision making. How can we make our app decide if the number of turns is reached or not? The uh, if uh, we call this if-else construct, is a very famous construct in programming. Almost any type of programming involves the if-else construct. Um, this is uh, a logical uh, evaluation. Um, it evaluates if uh, a condition is true or not. If the condition is true, one block of instructions will be executed. If the condition is not true, which means false, another block of instruction will be executed. The true-false data is represented by a type called Boolean. In Swift, it's B-O-O-L. So the condition inside the if statement need to be any expression that evaluates to a Boolean type. It could be a function name, it could be an expression with logical operators, or it could be a constant. It has to be either a true or a false. The if statement says if, followed by a condition in parentheses, and then there's a block of code. And that block of code will only be executed if the condition evaluates to true. You have an optional else. So else is not required. You can have an if without an else. The, when you add an else, you provide another set of instruction that will be executed only 
if the condition is evaluated to false. So we're going to be using the if-else to determine if the number of turns is reached 3 or not, and we will see how we're going to do that. Uh, so the condition I mentioned can be um, a constant, it's a true or false, it can be a function, um, and uh, some of the library classes have functions that allow you to evaluate two objects of that class. For instance, a string function has a, a, a function called compare, it has a function called uh, case insensitive compare. Um, um, Swift give you the ability to define a compare function to any object that you create. We haven't created any objects of our own yet. We're going to do that in the next project. Um, but we actually did a little bit of comparison in the sorting that we did in the previous project in module 3. Uh, in the sorting, uh, the sort function on an array required another function that returns a boolean. And in that function, we did some evaluation using a logical operator. Or in, in we, we did the case, the string comparison. You could also do a logical operator. Uh, logical operators uh, are less than, greater than. So when you say 5 greater than 6, that is called a logical expression. Why is it called a logical expression? Because it evaluates to either a true or a false. 5 greater than 6 is not 30, is not 11, it's not minus 1. 5 greater than 6 is false because the 5 is not greater than 6. So that's what a logical expression means. And these are the different logical operators that are available in Swift. Less than, greater than, greater equal, less equal, equal, not equal. That's the last one is not equal. So how are we going, what steps are we going to follow to implement this? We're going to, as you will see, so, so this iteration encompasses some, uh, lots of steps. You may have noticed going from module 1 to where we are now in module 4, in the beginning, in the iterations, they were very rudimentary iterations, uh, um, uh, very uh, low-level iterations, uh, very specific here. This iteration is a little bit higher level. It encompasses underneath it a lot of sophisticated tasks. Each one of those steps inside it, there's actually some further steps that can be done. Um, you, uh, if in module number one, each one of those steps, I would have made it an iteration. Here, uh, we gained a little bit more experience so we can encompass different steps and do them within the same iteration. So we're going to build the user interface of the game screen, adding the start game buttons, adding the node buttons. When I connect the user interface components as outlet, as an, an, an as actions, the labels need to be outlet. The uh, game uh, screen, uh, the, the buttons will need to be actions. Uh, then the, when, the, when the app loads, we need to uh, load the path to all the 12 music notes uh, so that we can uh, have an array with the music note. When the user click the start game, we're going to implement the action to uh, reset the game, uh, reset the counter of the turns and play the game. And then we're going to implement the play the game function to check if the number of turns is reached. And if so, if not, then play a random note. And then implement the check answer function to check if an answer is correct or not. Again, checking the answer if correct or not, we're going to use the if statement one more time. And then finally, run the app and test it. And there you will see in the next video how we go through each one of those. Perhaps it might be one or more videos depending on the time. Um, and then uh, we can test it and move on to the next iteration. So that concludes iteration number three. Thank you, and uh, we'll move on to embedding.